<laughs> Hello and welcome. I'm about to do an interview with Dr. Swan Nicole. Swan Nicole is a psychotherapist, a shaman, a medical intuitive, a sacred artist, an author, a minister. She's got an amazingly rich background. She's also a mother. And that brings me to my first question. The Mastery Club, as you know, features a green-haired girl called Nina who's been home educated and raised by parents who have really been very conscious about how they raised her. And they've taught her spiritual truths and universal laws from the time that she was very young. Well, this was an imaginary story I made up, but here we are having the opportunity to speak to Dr. Nicole and hear about her experiences raising her son, who's now 12. So welcome, Swan, and um, thank you for, for joining me for this interview. And, and please tell me a little bit about your journey. Tell us a little bit about your journey in raising your son and what ideas you wanted to communicate with him. Okay, thank you, Lillian, for taking this time out for interviewing me and asking these really important questions. So, yes, I have had the experience of unconsciously raising a son and consciously raising a son. So my first son was born 22 years ago and I knew very little of the wealth of information that I now have available to me and that I've been able to incorporate into the upbringing of my younger son who's 12. And from the very, actually before he was even conceived, I had very clear communication from spirit, from the divine realm that a very special child was coming to me and that I needed to prepare. So I was already preparing for this incoming child two years before he was born. So I was already working with my own consciousness, my own DNA to get myself reprogrammed and fine-tuned to be ready for a higher vibrational child, of course, because we all vibrate on different frequencies. It's a bit like radio station. And this child came in with a higher frequency and I needed to be able to to handle the frequency that he was bringing in through my body. So that's one of the first challenges that happens with parenting is actually when a mother is pregnant with a child and the imbalances of frequencies. I actually believe that's what morning sickness is. Mm -hmm. It's actually the challenge of the mother's system adjusting to having these other frequency waves coming through her because we are electromagnetic and everything is frequency. And then the whole time I was pregnant with Akasha, I was spending hours every day in meditation and communion with the divine realm. And I was working on, still on my DNA, but also on preparing his DNA so that he would be equipped to handle the environment he was coming into because at this time on the planet the environments that we're all dealing with are polluted, they're contaminated, we are being bombarded by so many different levels of contamination from electromagnetic frequencies from all the wireless, mobile phones, technology, everything else but also from the contamination in our food chain, the fact that we're not getting, however hard we try, if we're buying from a supermarket, we're not getting healthy, vibrant, alive food. We're getting food that's contaminated in some way or at least depleted. Mm -hmm. And also from vaccinations and medication. So clearly I've never done any of that stuff with my son. So that was the next thing moving along to when he's born. I brought him in in a very sacred environment, first of all, and he had no injections, no vaccinations. And I've continued to work with him through his life. And there are different stages with a child and a young adult when the soul and the spirit come into the body in phases. So there's a phase at two years old when a next level of soul and spirit are meant to come into the child's body. Now, in the old days, we had godmothers, and the role of the godmother was actually to psychically merge or connect with the, the levels of soul and spirit coming in and bring those in mm -hmm. to the body. Now, we, we don't understand in our modern culture the significance of that. Mm 
mm-hmm. or even mostly recognize the that these other levels exist and need to be taken care of. But I worked very consciously with this. So at every age that he was meant to embody a new level of himself, I have worked consciously, energetically, visually, with meditation and all the ways that I do to escort these parts of his higher self layer by layer into his body and keep reprogramming his DNA and keep grounding him. Mm -hmm. One of the results of this is that he's very, very, very rarely ever sick. You know, when they get the end of school year report, he's always the one who's had no days off. (laughs) Well, credit to all of that, uh, that work. Yeah, he's very, very tough. And he's very, very clear and very, very powerful. So at two years old, when I was having a negotiation with him about something I wanted him to do, and he asked why he should do that, and I told him what I thought, and he said, yes, but I'm not you, and you're not me. (laughs) At two. I do. Right. So I went, oh, my goodness, I have created a powerhouse that I have to now learn to handle. So the challenge for me has always been to anticipate where he's coming from. You know, at five years old, I found myself in a car having an argument with him about who was the boss. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, I stopped the car and went, how can I be arguing with a five-year-old child about who's in charge? And so I said to him, because I didn't want to undermine his power, but obviously I needed the clear boundary in place that for the time being, I am in charge. Mm. And so I explained to him that up in the heavens, before his soul came into his body, he was a big boss, he's a big guy. But that when he's born, when he comes, his soul comes into a child's body, He has to learn to be a child and learn all the earth rules. Mm -hmm. That's why he chose me as his mother because I have that experience and I I am here to teach him that. And if I teach him well and he learns well, he can grow up in this life, in this body to be a big boss. Mm. And he accepted that because I wasn't undermining his sense of his own power. I love what you said then about... um honoring his power and and yet having it work for you as well having those boundaries in that respect because so often we we see parents putting their kids down don't we you know yes. to, putting them in their box and in their place and because i said so and i'm the you know all of that sort of thing and and that's um, right we, we need to recognize them as sentient beings and as intelligent conscious beings because they do have a consciousness that they're connected to that very often isn't recognized. And, of course, in Australia, one of the national uh, characteristics that I've noticed is this whole tall poppy syndrome. Mm. You know, and, and very often Australians want people to be small poppies. Mm. And mm. my perspective is why can't we have lots of fields of tall poppies? Mm. Can't we all be tall poppies? And mm. these children coming in with this new DNA – are here to create a new paradigm on the planet. So we need to encourage them and support them to be fully here, to be seen and acknowledged in their light and their potential. And at the same time, like you say, to balance that out with direction and boundaries because they need to know we're in charge. They need to know that we're in charge to feel safe. Mm. I had a similar experience when when um, my children were very young because I grew up with um, a mother and a grandmother who went through the Holocaust. And all the stories that I heard as a child of the Nazis and the cruelty and all of this sort of thing left me with the questions of, um, you know, really questioning mindless obedience because I could see through the the Nazis, through the SS and all of that, there was this just this, I'm handing over my power to to kill all these people because I've been told to kill them, you know? Yes. And and I grew up not wanting, as a young mother, I did not want to play uh, power over my children. I didn't want to make them obedient to me, you know, because I could just see the dangers of this minus obedience. But then I struck the other side of it, which was that you did need some level of 
you know, quiet obedience or cooperation in order to run the the household ship smoothly, you know. And so when your children have been raised, and my mother raised us, me and my sisters that way too, for the same reason. She she wanted us to have our own voices, you know, and we did. And it means there's a lot more arguing and fighting, you know, all of that sort of thing because everyone was free to express and and not afraid to to speak up sort of thing. Well, that's right. And one of the... One of the main points about this conversation that's really crucial is that as a parent of a growing child, the parent needs to keep doing their inner work because the child will reflect what's going on with the parent. And if there are any shaky areas where the parent is not clear or is carrying old wounding or negative patterns or limitations, the child will mirror that and play up against it. And the parent will lose lose its point of power in the relationship. And then the child will be running the relationship. Mm. So at every age, when you have a two-year-old child, parents need to go back and look at what was happening with them at two years old mm-hmm. and so on. Mm. Okay, so you feel that it's that precise. Because I do agree, there is this, what's expressed here is repressed here, that dynamic. I, I completely yeah. agree in relation to parenting. So you think it literally is related because I've heard this before as well and I haven't been that conscious of it in my parenting journey of the the actual ages so at that as a particular age that is activating that age in the parent yes yeah. yes that makes because sense. They're, that makes sense. <clears throat> they're mirroring those parts of us mm. Mm. and they are challenging those parts of us so you know if we had your control issues and negotiating with our parents and arguing and rebelling in adolescence and early teens, then those areas will be challenging for us when our children start to hit them unless we deal with them Mm. within ourselves. Mm. Mm. Okay, so that's great. So you've basically, you were very, very conscious about about being pregnant and literally communicating with the soul that was coming in consciously um, and then raising the child communicating with the, with your son all the time honoring your son honoring yourself making sure that relationship was was you know respectful both ways and yes. being very and and being constantly conscious that whatever's happening is a mirror for something back to you and that you yes. keep working and growing yourself so would you say those are some of the main things around how you've chosen to parent then we Yes, absolutely. And one of the things is that because these children are coming in with more evolved DNA, mm-hmm. they it it behoves us to activate our higher DNA. So we have to be doing the inner work and we have to be establishing a communication with the divine because there really aren't enough teachings and there isn't enough information, enough guidance for us as to how to bring up our children. We are pioneering a new way of parenting and we're pioneering a new generation of beings, of conscious Mm. beings. So unless we are activating our direct communication with the divine and able to get answers, you know, in the moment when I was negotiating with my son about who's the boss, I prayed, okay, Jesus, someone up there, show me what to say to this child. And the answer was there. Suddenly I knew. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know that from my own experience. Mm -hmm. So we need to be getting guidance wherever we can and discovering what these children are here for as well. Each child has a unique purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, my son's had three accidents in the last three years at the same time of year. Ah major one three years ago when he was thrown through the rear closed side window of his father's truck and 10 meters through the air over a barbed wire fence into a field and the surgeon and the ambulance and everyone just said this child should be dead you know it's impossible and he did have some damage but I had him out of hospital in two days because I was able to tune in to his higher purpose understand what was going on all the levels of why this has happened, and then the healing was given. Mm-hmm. I'd like to pick up on this um, business about purpose because one of the things that we've heard a lot in the in the you know new age movement or community is that we are here to be the conscious and deliberate creators of our lives. Yeah. And so I'd love to hear your your take on that. I know in the Mastery Club, I'm attempting to offer some um, tools 
and in particular visualization as a tool towards t deliberately and consciously creating some of the, the things that we would like to manifest in our lives. And I know you use meditation a lot in your practice, so I'd love to hear your, your take on this, about being the conscious creator of our lives, and, and to what degree is that what we are here to do? Is that our purpose, do you feel, as, as um, people, you know, humans on earth at the moment, as souls incarnate? Yes. Well, I feel our purpose is to evolve spiritually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Ultimately, the goal is to discover ourselves as spiritual beings having a human experience and bringing the, sp the spiritual and the material world together. Yeah. So becoming more and more conscious. And that is everyone's destination. And some people will get there sooner than others. Some people will take more lives and go on a longer journey to dis to come to that point. Yeah, absolutely. We're here to get conscious. We're here to be conscious of being spiritual beings who have had many lives in many different realities and are now having a human experience and to bring that spiritual consciousness into our human life. And the crises and upheavals we're seeing on the planet are because Humans are in a period of immense forgetting of who they are and what they're really here to do. We've lost the knowledge. It's not in teachings. We haven't been taught it by our elders, our grandparents, because they weren't taught it. Yeah. So we don't have very much wisdom of the elders and the ancient spiritual traditions being passed down to guide us. Mm -hmm. And we have been vastly misled and misguided by the religious institutions and yep. educational institutions. So we're having to learn it all again and we're having to take it to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. And there is way more light and information available on this planet at this time than there has been for many thousand years. And light and is consciousness. Mm. So it 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 affords us this potential, this wealth of of fields of information and consciousness and intelligence that we can tap into to create a new paradigm, and that is what we're being called to. As the old infrastructures are falling falling apart, and that is part of the plan. The old infrastructures are obsolete; they are no longer relevant. And they are no longer serving us. And we know that. Everyone out there knows that the systems aren't working. Mm. It's so, too much. Sorry, there's too much corruption, too much greed. Everything is out of balance. And the only way we can get a new ba get things back into balance is actually to create a new paradigm that's based on completely different values. So I want to pick up on your comment about creating a new paradigm. So you would say that the paradigm we're creating is, is one of being... Um, conscious creators on the planet that we are here to manifest some higher visions would you say is that oh absolutely we're moving into an era that is scientific fact that we don't really have time to go into here on this interview but it is known by scientists that we're moving into an era where we have the potential to create an age of enlightenment, a new world renaissance, and that's very much my mission, the new world renaissance, a sacred world renaissance. And what we've lost is the sacred ways of living. And people have become so disconnected from spirituality and so dis discouraged, dismayed, disappointed by the religious institutions, that they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Mm. And the reason things aren't working is because we are not finding sacred ways of doing, being, living, earning, and creating. And when we start to deal with this polarization and create more of a unity of spiritual worlds with material worlds, we will come back into balance. Mm. That's we have to do that, and I absolutely am 100% convinced that it is the only tenable future for humanity. Is to have this this um, balance and this honouring of, of the physical and the or material and the spiritual and having them work in harmony. 
Without yes, and when I talk about material, you're right. I mean the physical world. I don't just mean the world of, of money and finance. I mean our physical experience, our physical reality. The environment and, and the, whole, the whole thing. Yeah, and our physical okay. bodies and honouring and looking after yeah. them as well. Yeah. All right, so one of the things that you do in your practice is a lot of meditation and that to me seems like it's it's very soft it's feminine it brings one into the heart and connects one with the intuition and it's and you know when we look at our lives today we're harried we're rushed we are there's just such an information overload most people are stressed to the max yeah. and i once heard somebody say that their understanding of the spiritual purpose in a sense of this this huge information overload is to actually push us out of our heads, out of our conscious kind of thinking and figuring out mode into our hearts and into our intuition so that when we can't actually, you know, think it through, we'll, we will tune Lots. into the right response at a, at a feeling level. Do, do, does that resonate for you? Yes, absolutely it does. And first of all, I want to clarify that I am not a big conventional meditator. I don't often sit in lotus position in silent meditation. That's not my So the thing about meditation is that it's a tool to prepare us and align us. I am not a big one for sitting in conventional meditation, lotus position, hours of silent mm. emptiness. That's not the way I meditate. I believe there are different forms of meditation. Prayer can actually be a meditation. Any communion with the divine or any quiet time in nature, being mindless can be a meditation. I tend to be in communion. So I get into a deeply introverted still space and then ask to be shown what I need to be shown. I believe that the last 20 or 30 years Many of us have been preparing for this time on the planet. And from where I'm looking, we're running out of time to sit around for hours and hours and hours meditating. We actually need to be moving into a, a time, a period of sacred activism, of getting on with what we really came here to do. And so you're right, things are speeding up. And at this point, we really have to be able to catch the waves as they come at us. And that relies entirely on our intuition. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned recently when I was attending a workshop, which we'll talk about in a moment, and I've heard Caroline Mace also talk about the fact that to do a spiritual journey in the past, we used to go into monasteries and all that sort of thing. And nowadays... We don't do that, but we are doing our spiritual practice, our spiritual growth in our everyday relationships and our everyday work and jobs and all the rest of it. Like all of that is being made more conscious rather than doing your life and then going off into a monastery to do the conscious stuff there. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, you agree with that, huh? That Absolutely. Our initiations in this life are our lives, our relationships, our experiences in the world are the initiation. It's never been done before in this way that we're actually being initiated as we live our daily lives. It's come together in an intensification because we don't have that, we don't have the time and the space to retreat into the wilderness, wilderness for 40 years. Mm. <laughs> No. You know, just not happening. Things are speeding up. We're dealing with many more levels of things than have ever uh, been dealt with before at one time in one way. We're all having to multitask and we're all being affected by different things on many different dimensions at the same time. And so people mostly aren't even consciousness of, conscious of the things that are affecting them on the different levels. And this cannot be fathomed with the left brain, with the rational mind. It can only be managed if we allow ourselves to 